I feel like I'm like a Emmy Awards or something. I'm coming through that curtain. Um, thank you, Kimberly. That was very sweet. Uh, very sweet. And Skip, uh, Skip didn't say this, but uh, Skip and I have been old friends back uh, from the 80s uh, when I was doing Democratic campaigns and doing stuff for the uh, uh, Democratic Party, the DNC. And so it's great to see you again here at this beautiful, beautiful facility. I was, last time I was in Little Rock, none of this, this was an old railroad station, but none of this was here. It's, it's just fabulous, I think, what an asset the community has. And um, to be able to come here and see this um, is really astounding. I was saying back there, it's, I'm a huge fan of presidential libraries and um, museums, having been to a number of them. I actually had the opportunity uh, to go to some between the first election when George Bush got elected president in 2000 and 2004, one of the things that we were concerned about is the difference in running a re-election campaign when you hold the White House, when you're a president running for re-election as opposed to somebody coming in. And so I sat down with uh, Andy Card, then Chief of Staff Andy Card and Carl Rove, and they didn't want anybody to know about this, so they asked me to go to various presidential libraries and look in the private papers to figure out in memos. Uh, much of it has not been released. It's one of the interesting things about presidential libraries that you may know or not know. You, everybody doesn't have access to all the papers at once. It's, it's done over time many times. And some of the papers actually are never given um, and released uh, to the public. One of the things about presidential uh, libraries is that while Campaigns are very involved in the course of the administration. They are not necessarily included by law, memos and campaign stuff, by law in what goes in or not, or what's public or not. And so campaign memos that somebody might have written and all of that is not necessarily open to the public. It's totally to the discretion. And so um, I went to the Reagan Library, which actually Nancy Reagan herself had to give me permission to look at some of the papers that not, nobody had seen, some of the campaign papers. I went to Bush's library in College Station in Texas. I went to Ford's uh, library, um, who though hadn't won our first election, had, had, had won, had, was running against Jimmy Carter, obviously, in 1976. And I went to the Baker Institute, which actually, James Baker Institute, which was at Rice University, which I think now is moving to Princeton, but it was at Rice University and was probably the not many people know about it, but probably one of the best places to get access to information like that. Because I think pe people forget about James Baker. James Baker managed Gerald Ford's campaign in 1976 for president. And then he went to work for Ronald Reagan. And then he was chairman of George Bush's campaign in 1992. And so he has actually been involved in nearly every single campaign at a high level starting from the mid-70s. And so I went to all those, and so I got great access with that. It was so, and I say all that because it was just a fascinating experience. I, I'll give you some interesting things. One of the things you find, obviously, in campaign papers is like coffee stains and McDonald's wrappers and all of that kind of stuff. They're in boxes, actually. If you go in some of these libraries, nobody's ever asked, and all this stuff's in boxes that nobody's ever been through, the campaign papers. And you see how much campaigns are all about the people, but all about the personalities and all about that dynamic that it gets. So you see friendly notes to each other and not so friendly notes to each other in the course of that. There was one that I thought that struck me that I thought that there was an agenda item that um, was a meeting with Ronald Reagan in the course of the reelect, and he was doing debate prep, and it was on the back of like an agenda item for the campaign and there were, or, or what they wanted to talk about that thing. And on the back of it was a handwritten note from James Baker on the back of this agenda item, and it was to somebody else in the room. I don't know if it was somebody, the press secretary or somebody, and it said, the president's feeling down today. Why don't you tell him he looks good? <laughs> and it was passed from James Baker to somebody, a president of the United States at a debate prep thing, which is to me so perfect, which is like, it's all, everything's high school. Never, we never leave high school, <laughs> really, no matter what level we get to. Um, 
I'm going to touch on a couple of things, and I really want this to be an open sort of discussion. You got, y'all can ask me anything. You know what it's like to work there. How's the White House? You know, is Arnold really as nutty as he thinks he is? And from the movies, um, whatever. Uh, uh, all anything y'all want to ask me about. Um, I've given a, a couple of talks. I try to, you know, having worked in the Democratic campaigns most of my life, and George Bush having been the first Republican. I worked for, and then having, if somebody knows sort of my history, having a rather public break with the President of the United States on the front page of the New York Times um, over a number of issues. I'm sort of a man without a country, really. So I, I have friends, uh, Democratic Party. I, uh, there's obviously things I totally agree with on each side. Um, but I try to, my uh, sort of approach has always been as, as best as possible, it's one of the things I'll talk about today, is to try to see things in as objective manner as possible, even though we all walk into life with our own biases and prejudices. Everything we do, we carry biases and prejudices from our family backgrounds to the education to where we grew up, all of those sorts of things, we walk in with biases and prejudices, acknowledging that and try to be objective. It's funny, I, I've had given talks to press secretaries in Washington about how to communicate with the public or what should you do with the media or with you know corporate people like what's the best way to you know here's five rules or whatever six rules to to uh, you know talk to the public and here's and remember and I always say you know the first number one rule is tell the truth be honest and I'm always amazed about half the audience starts writing it down like, okay, I got rule number one, tell the truth, be honest. I think I can do that. Okay, what are the other four rules? Um, so I'm going to try to, from my, as best as I say, from my own perspective, to try to tell the truth as I see it and as where I think stand. And from, a, from having watched, been involved, and then obviously having watched over the last three or four years where that stands. One thing is you, get a, you all get a lot of speakers here, and you see a lot of speakers in light in, in, in your lives and at different events. And I think many times we make the assumption is, like they arrived, I was saying this to Skip in the back, like you're born on the mountaintop, like you're born, like you're born into like, oh, he did a presidential campaign. I guess that's what he does. Well, all of us who've ever done campaigns, and the lucky very few of us in this country, if you think about it, if you think about a presidential campaign, which comes along as often as the Olympics, every four years, and only about 200 or 250 on each side are staff on a presidential campaign. So every four years, about 500 people get to work on staff out of 300 and something million Americans on a presidential campaign that happens at you know, winners and looters. Almost every single person that I've ever been involved in, including myself, started somewhere stuffing envelopes, volunteering, making phone calls, doing just the basics as you did that, and just happened to be through hard work and some smarts, but really through uh, you know, God's grace or luck, that you happened to be in the right place at the right time that you were able to do it. Because there's a whole bunch of very smart people politically out there that have never been able to be involved in a presidential campaign. Not because they weren't smart enough and not because they didn't work hard enough, but they didn't happen to be in the right place at the right time because the candidate that was there that you happened to be involved with or, or you were close to that then ran for president and then actually won. Um, and so we all have been, all of us that have been in through this, that been through this process have gone through, have you know, toiled in the vineyards in many ways and done all that. And most of us have a perspective or I hope retain a perspective that we were lucky to be in this position. And it's not that we were smarter than somebody else or that, but that we were lucky and, and worked hard and actually believed, uh, believed in a cause. I tell people to emphasize this point that um, I remember a race I did for state rep in a rural county not far from Dallas, Texas. Um, it was a guy running for state rep in a couple of counties up there. And, and for a state rep, I got the title, I think I was like 23 or 24 years old, 24 years old. And so you don't get paid a lot, you get a nice title. So I was the field director of the campaign, of the state rep campaign, the field director, which meant that I had to deal with all the volunteers because you don't really have a staff as a field director in a state rep campaign. And so I was out, all these volunteers who never block, walked blocks or walked up to people's houses. And so I, was t I took them out, like 12 of them, and said, here's what we're going to do. Let me show you how to do this. And had the, you know, the pamphlet and all of that. And 
I went up to this house and knocked on the door, and all the volunteers were sort of sitting on the, down by the sidewalk, and they were just like watching me or whatever, and had the pamphlet. I knocked on the door, and as the door opened, I noticed there was something on the door, and I didn't quite read it. And as the door opened, there was two 77, 78-year-old, a couple, completely naked, standing in front of me. <laughs> she, I think, had like pink slippers on. Um, that was it. That was two. And so at this point, I was like, whoa. Uh, and so I, I did the sort of like, here, I'd like you to vote for Keith Oakley. Um, uh, you know, he said he's a believer here, oh, uh, by the way. And I turn around walking, and all the volunteers are laughing their heads off. And the door shuts, and on the door it says, home of the Kaufman County nudist colony. <laughs> they had established their own thing. And I got back and said, well, there's a lesson learned. Always pay attention to the details on the door. Um, so, you know, you see, we, all start, we all start from somewhere. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, Kimberly had mentioned that I've, I've been a commentator. I do commentating on ABC News, which is a blast, and it's really fun. And people's like, well, you know, with people that are on, on you know, television, they're celebrities and all that. And I like to tell people, I was walking through an airport one time, and this woman came up to me last year sometime, and she goes, I know you, I know who you are. And you know, you sort of go, you know, you're like, oh, okay, that's great. And she goes, yeah, I know who you are. And you think, okay, we're about to, she's gonna ask me about politics or what I think about Obama or what's gonna happen or whatever. And she goes, aren't you the Dallas weatherman? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, I wanna touch on a couple of things and then as I say, we leave it open to questions. One thing that I like to talk to people about because I think it affects life is um, it's a sociological term and it's called confirmation bias. And what confirmation bias is, and I think it's very important to understand when we look at that, confirmation bias is something that we do as human beings, which is we seek out information that confirms what we already have an opinion about, that we already agree with, a bias that we all have, and ignore or push away information that's disconfirming, that is against that. And we do it all the times in our lives, it happens at every level, um, it happens more and more in politics, unfortunately, because the channels for which people to get confirming evidence um, makes this country, is one part of the reason why we're more polarized in this country. It happens in our personal relationships. You know, we ignore information that we should know about her or him, and then pretty soon we say, God, I should have caught that, but I ignored it because I like wanted to believe or wanted to hope. It happens in big things. Um, the Iraq war, whether you agree with it or not, there was much confirmation bias that went in and gathering the information and what the CIA and the intelligence operations, people had a bias of what they thought Saddam Hussein and they sought information that confirmed that and ignored information that didn't. And it happens in campaigns all the time. It happens in how people make decisions in campaigns, internally in campaigns. We think, oh, I got it, we know what I, I know what we need to do. Um, and then you seek out evidence or polling that confirms that. It happens in White Houses all the times on how decisions are made. Oh no, we're on the right track, we're on the right track. That, look at this information and there's a whole bunch of other information uh, that's out there that, that is disconfirming that we ignore. And as I say, I think we are now in a society because of you know, the average person in this country right now has 94 channels in their home, uh, is what the average person has in this country, the internet and access. And so what happens is, is you get Republicans or conservatives that watch Fox News and listen to Rush Limbaugh and basically confirm everything that they already believe. And then you have liberals or Democrats that watch MSNBC and listen to a particular radio show or watch, read a certain newspaper or whatever and begin to confirm with what they, what they believe. And what happens is, is when you have an opinion and then in the process of seeking out information is constantly confirming in that, what happens, your opinion becomes a fact. And when your opinion is no longer just an opinion and a fact you can't have a conversation with somebody. Because I can't have a conversation with you if I think, my, if I think what I believe is a fact and you're disagreeing with me, I just think like I'm not going to talk to you, how can you disagree with this fact? And that's what's happening I think more and more in this country. I think more and more people are not seeking out information and understanding what's going on and something they don't agree with or, or disagree with why we don't have bipartisanship as much, and all of those sorts of things, much of it has to do with the fact that we are uncomfortable exposing ourselves to thoughts and beliefs that are different from ours. And which is why I think this school, and what this school does about 
and all the learning and all the education that goes on at the school is so important not only for the classes that are taught but for the back for the fact that ki the kids here are being exposed to cultures totally outside their comfort zone whether it's in India or Africa or Indonesia wherever it happens to be that I think is all a process of exposure that gives people a broader view of things and then will actually people will be able to have a conversation in a, in a constructive way to reach maybe good pub public policy goals. One thing, I, had, I do this in a different setting, but um, I think it's always important in confirmation bias, as I say, goes along with a lot of things, especially true in the media. The media comes up with a storyline, whatever it happens to be, liberal, conservative, whatever, and they look out and seek out interviews to confirm that and then write that story, or and that's what it is, and it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Much of that happens in the aftermath of campaigns. The myths that are promulgated in the aftermath of campaigns, not the least of which by all of us who win, because losers, nobody writes, nobody's going to read the John McCain campaign, you know, the great John McCain campaign from 2008. Nobody's going to read that book. Or the, you know, George Bush campaign from 1992, look what we did. Um, it's all written by the winners. Um, and so we get to write it all. And of course, as part of that process is, God, I'm, Matthew's a smart guy. He, look at all that stuff. And then I give evidence of why I'm a smart guy. Uh, because like here, I'm smart because I did these five things and those caused us to win or this was what happened. Much of that, some of it is true, but much of it is myths. And much of it, uh, the press likes that myth. And Washington DC loves the construction of a myth. Uh, to me, uh, Karl Rove is a perfect example of that. Karl Rove, the myth is evil genius. Well, I know, I've known Karl and worked with Karl both sides of the aisle. This is Karl, Karl is neither <laughs> evil or a genius. But it's a great myth that's been you know, put out there and that it makes, it makes it great for Republicans to say, look at this, he's the smartest guy and all this. And you know, or, and it makes it great for Democrats because it's the evil Karl Rove and all that. But much of it is myths. There's parts of truth, obviously, to it. To me, some of that has happened with Barack Obama. And if you have a discussion with anybody in the course of it, why Barack Obama won, you'll get many different answers of that. Oh, they ran a great field organization. They had a tremendous field organization. They did all this. They had new technology, and they did all this great new technology and did all this. Barack Obama won because he's the greatest orator since Cicero, and he's... <laughs> He's just phenomenal, isn't it? It's just unbelievable. The one, he's just great. It's him. Or they raise more money than, you know, than you know, the New York Manhattan Bank gets from the federal government. And they got, they, you know, he spent all, he was able to raise more money and do all these fundraisers and that's it. And you'll get a lot of those answers. Most of the time you won't get the reason, which the reason, all of those are obviously factors in a victory in a presidential campaign. But the dominant reason why Barack Obama is President of the United States fundamentally had nothing to do with Barack Obama. Fundamentally. And the reason I say that is because the dynamic in the landscape of the country at a time was by and large all things sort of roughly being the same was going to elect a credible Democrat to the presidency. Hillary Clinton would have won would have been elected president if she had won the primary by somewhere between probably four and eight points. She would have been elected. I've seen all the polling, all the data, all that. she would have been elected by that. Anybody that was a credible, that became, that the public thought was a credible candidate would have won that race. People were tired of Bush. They were tired of Republicans. They wanted something different. That's not to say that, that Barack Obama is not a great not a, not a great order. That's not to say that they didn't run a great campaign. That's not to say many, they didn't raise money. They didn't do all those things. But I think what happens is, is many times people see that, the myth, the myth promulgates that. It comes to you. It comes and sits with you in the White House. Is you might not have believed it on election day, but that by the time everybody and your friends and the media and George Stephanopoulos and everybody tells you how smart you are and what a great campaign you run, it doesn't take long before you begin to believe it. And I think much of White Houses, the reasons why I think many White Houses stumble and don't look as effective as you think they should be or they were, is because in that process, 
they begin to say, oh, it was the reason why we won, the reason why we did this was because of me, and they forget about there was 300 million Americans out there that were coming at the conclusion that you just happened to be a tiny part in the cog of where the American public was going. And I think that happens a lot, and I think it's happened with the Obama administration in the course of this. And I've obviously, I've been chosen uh, to be involved in campaigns because I love campaigns and I like the people that I've worked with um, at, at different levels. Not to say that all of those people haven't broken your heart in the course of that. We all put our hopes and dreams. I, as I told the New York Times one time when I, when I was doing this break with the president, I said it's a lot like a relationship. Politics is a lot like a relationship, which is, is that you fall in love with these people and then you ignore the first time they come home drunk. Um, or they ran the car into the wall and you get it fixed and then you say they're not going to do it again or they, you're gonna, they're going to get a job or they're going to do and you and then at some point you're like after like doing this for a while you're like well maybe I was uh, I misread this deal uh, from whatever but sometimes things change but all of those hopes and dreams that we have and I think in the course of a conduct administration and we've seen this a consistent pattern I think part of what the rationale for why somebody won, I think, is forgotten by people, or it becomes easier to do something else once you go in the administration. And to me, the main dynamic that was playing itself out in November of 2008 is the American public, not everybody, but by and large, wanted a president that was sort of a next generation of leader, leadership, that was going to bring people together and reestablish an American community and an American campfire in a way that we could be, have conversations with each other and resolve policy disputes and come together and solve the problems that are serious in this country, whether it has to do with Afghanistan, Iraq, our economy, healthcare, whatever it happens to be. That was a fundamentally, in my view, what was going on in this country. And Barack Obama spoke to that very well. How do we bring people together? to get them outside of their self-interest so they come together in a common interest and do that. We are as far from that, that what the American public wanted in November of 2008 today as we were when that was spoken to in 2000 in the course of the time that we happened there. And so you could have many conversations with people about why that happens. I think much of that happens because there's a belief in the myth. It becomes easier to do things in Washington the same old way. It becomes easier than then not to be able to sit down. It becomes easier to fight with your enemies instead of your friends. It's easier to fight with your enemies instead of your friends. But many times the route to good policy is a fight with your friends. And I think um, that as we've seen this unfold, I think the health care process that we've seen unfold um, is a process, regardless of the specific policy disputes and all that. I'm a believer that, um, not in that the ends justify the means, I'm a believer that the means justifies the ends. Meaning that if you have a good system in place and you can have a conversation and you can bring yourself together with substantive compromise and have real discussion, the end result will be pub good public policy that is accepted by the American public. When you have a bad means, when the means becomes very polarized and very dis, dis whether, whether the Republicans hold Congress or Democrats hold Congress, it doesn't matter. If the means get corrupted, then the ends are likely not going to be either the right public policy or a public policy that the vast majority of the American public does not accept. And if, them, if public policy is foisted on the American public and they don't accept it, they are going to do things in counter to that, or they're going to be, they're going to sort of not pay attention to it, or they're going to ignore their leaders, or whatever it happens to be. Where I think we are, because it's the most recent, recent thing sitting in front of us, I think that on health care reform, the worst thing from a political perspective, but we could, you could also make a public policy, the worst thing the Democrats could do is force a bill through and just jam it through and get it done politically. I think that would be the worst thing they could do because then every mistake that happens, anytime somebody has to wait in line at the emergency room after that bill, the Democrats are at fault. Anytime somebody's bill goes up 5% at the doctor's office after that bill, the Democrats are at fault. Anytime anything happens in the aftermath and somebody's costs don't go down, somebody's coverage, somebody has a dispute over something else, it's the Democrats' fault. And in the end, I don't think 
the American public would not accept that, I think, if that was forced through. It, it's funny, there, the problem, I think, is for, for Obama in the aftermath of this is not that a health care bill didn't happen, it's that the American public, he lost the American public in the course of this process. In this course of this process that he started out with their support in a lengthy period of process, lost that support. And there's many factors for that, not the least of which, in my view, is that he left it up to Congress too much um, and gave it to too many 200, 300 voices to talk about it as opposed to one voice to talk about it. I don't think he gave enough details fast enough about what it would mean and what it not would mean. I think he, he, they started attacking enemies of it when they should have ignored it. Um, instead of getting in a battle with somebody that shows up at a town hall meeting, you know, talk, get broader and get bigger on the thing. I think just like Social Security for Bush in 2005, having watched that and been involved in that and tried to have, having tried to give it political advice in the course of that, is when you're in a situation where you're now trying to convince the American public about why they're wrong to believe something, you are basically having, lo you've lost the battle. If you are basically, instead of Barack Obama, which it says, I represent what the public wants and I have to convince those knuckleheads in Congress. Instead of that debate, it's now, it's now a situation where Barack Obama is out there trying to say, well, no, you're wrong to believe that. No, you're wrong to believe that. Instead of it being him against Washington, D.C., it feels like him against a whole bunch of southern people in the country that have come up, that have decided that they don't like it. And so he's now in the position of arguing with voters instead of arguing with Congress. And presidents never win when they're arguing with voters. They never win when they're arguing with voters in the course of this. And I think that sets, us, that sets things up for the midterms. I think as of today, and everything in politics is as of today, though the American public is really like a, um, a battleship or an or a, a aircraft carrier. It turns, but it turns really, really slow. Um, it doesn't, it's, like, it's not overnight. I mean, I love how people say, well, you know, all those people showed up at town hall meetings screaming and the cable shows covered it and now people don't like health care. Like, like the cause of the problems on health care were because a bunch of people went to town hall meetings mad about it as opposed to the people went to the town hall meeting because there was a symptom of a problem, not that that, that it was the problem and created the problem. And so I think as we head towards in the, as the, 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 the uh, battleship of the country's public opinion head towards the midterms next year, what you're likely to see um, is that Republicans, not because they have some great program and they've come up with this great vision and all that, none of which they'd have, obviously. Um, there's no, they have not done that. We'll gain seats in the House and we'll gain seats in the Senate. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's as big enough wave today to, to retake the Senate and the House, but they will gain seats and gain, gain seats in the House and gain seats in the Senate. And I think that would be the best possible outcome for Barack Obama going forward. I think the presidents get in a situation where they own, in a substantive way, they get in a bad situation when they own all the levers of power in Washington. If you think about what happened to George Bush, at the beginning of it, it was much compromise. That was the, you know, compromise with Teddy Kennedy on education that he did. It was, some, it was compromises that he did on, on some of the first round of tax cuts. Obviously 9-11 happened, but when the Republicans took over the Senate in 2002, it was goodbye compromises, really, when that happened, because there was no longer a political need or political necessity to get that done. Um, and, and, you know, we all want to hope and believe that all of these people are going to be their best possible selves and all that, but everybody's a human being, and it becomes easier, as I say, to deal with your, your friends, and as opposed, it becomes easier to be friends to your friends instead of trying to be friends with your enemies in, in the course of this. So, that's my sense from a campaign perspective. That's really what I wanted to touch on. Um, and again, and I'll, I'll, we'll take it as long as Skip allows us to have a conversation about stuff. It really, uh, to me, uh, politics and civil service and public service is, is um, the noblest thing I think people can get involved with. I think it's for me, I started when I was 17 years old uh, handing out pamphlets or licking envelopes. Almost every single person I have come in contact with in politics and in the course of campaigns and in government is in it for the right reason and good intention. Whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, they're in it because they, they believe that what they want to do will better somebody's lives 
or be the right thing for somebody. Um, that's I do the cynical view that people are out there and they're only doing it and they have some particular special interest. I've never met those people and I have worked at every level in politics from, as I say, from state rep to president on both sides of the aisle. Um, I worked for Lloyd Benson, who was picked by Dukakis. I was at the 92 convention in, with, when Ann Richards chaired the podium uh, for Clinton in, in 1992. I was in Philadelphia when Bush got nominated in New York, back in New York, which is interesting. The two people that I think were at both conventions were Zell Miller and me in New York at two opposite conventions. Actually, he and I talked about that on the floor, having been involved in both conventions, one on the Democrat, one in New York, one on the Democrat, one on the Republican side. Every one of those people is in it, has been in it for the right reason and has good intentions. And we lose sight of that, I think. And I think, as I say, one of the benefits of a place like this is to try to reinstitute the idea that you can be on the opposite side of something, but you don't have to impugn somebody's intention. And the other thing I think that people forget in public service and politics is that relationship with you, you never know uh, the relationships that you have, where they're going to come back and in whatever level that you have in those relationships. You never know how they're going to impact you. I tell my older boys all the time, I said, you're going to cross over more bridges you've already crossed than new bridges in your life. You're going to cross over more bridges you've already crossed than new ones. And I could tell people a perfect example. In 1991, I was 29 years old doing a mayor's race in Houston. Sort of unknown guy named Bob Lanier who was running for mayor. He ended up winning. And Bob Lanier was a wealthy guy, so he went out and tried to like bring together all the smart, good people. This was 1991, 17 years ago. On that campaign, 1991, was I was doing the strategy in 1991 and helping on the field. Mark McKinnon, who you've heard his name, is a friend of mine who, was, did, who did Bush's media and then worked for McCain, uh, was involved doing press work then. He wasn't even doing ads then. Bill McInturf, who was McCain's pollster this time and works at uh, NBC Wall Street, was doing the polling on this race. This is 17 years ago. David Axelrod was doing the media in this race. And the, you know who the person was doing opposition research? Rahm Emanuel <laughs> on that campaign, the five of us. And we five stayed friends. I've stayed friends with Rahm and David, uh, all those folks. Um, uh, and, and so to me, that's the, if you can do that, and we have each traveled very different paths, obviously very different paths, but still be able to remain friends and all that and have discussions or disputes, that to me is the benefit of a place like this and a lecture series like this. So thank you all, and I'll be happy to take whatever questions you all have. Thank you. All right. <laughs> questions? All right, let's, let's start here with the Helen Thomas of the Clinton School. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we accept your experienced campaign wisdom that you've just shared. My question is, how will you strategize for the rest of the 21st century, starting with the election of 2012, 14, 16, when we know that technologically, we have all become global citizens watching other democracies emerge. Mm -hmm. First place, I am a participatory democracy advocate. I believe that the town hall meetings that we are having is the best thing that America could have as a constitutional participatory democracy. The question again is, mm -hmm. how would you as a campaign manager for me recommend a strategy for 2014, 16, or 18? Sure. Well, it's a good question, actually, and I think, I mean, part of the thing is, you know, not fully knowing um, what's going to emerge and what's, what's going to change. I mean, we are in a society that is changing faster than it ever has before. Technology one day or the advances of it. I remember, and Skip knows full well, we thought it was like the greatest thing when we got fax machines in campaigns. And uh, there's probably office buildings that wouldn't, within a year or two were filled with fax machines that have never really been used. I remember this campaign was like, wow, we can't believe we have fax machines. Um, and so you don't fully know where it's going to change. I do think there are some fundamentals that are going to play out over the next, and I think Barack Obama 
Um, it began before Barack Obama, but I think that through the course of that, I think there has been such a loss of faith and trust in the, every major institution in this country simultaneously. If you think about it, we've lost faith and trust with our government, especially the federal government. Most people have that whether it's going to meet their needs. We've lost faith and trust in corporations, which were used to be viewed as paternalistic. We've lost faith and trust in most of our churches. Um, because of scandals and all those things that happen. We've lost faith and trust in the media that they're going to tell us the truth. We've lost faith and trust in many sports institutions, which were a binding effort. I remember I, one day I picked up the page, and it, it was a question in the sports page that day was, did Barry Bonds do his record counts because, you know, he, he was juiced? We didn't know the Tour de France winner because it was one who did it, one did it, one did it. And then there was a, somebody in basketball, a referee in basketball, bet on basketball. And then there was the ongoing, obviously, Pete Rose saga. Should he be allowed? Should he not be allowed? And that all would happen all simultaneously. I say all that because I still, there is a great desire, and anybody involved in politics has to meet the desire the country has, which is, is how are we going to, how are we going to build our own community? How are we going to give ourselves uh, a cheers, a show of cheers, where people know your name? Because we've now become so separated and we have no institutions that we believe will bring us together, is I think it's going to be up to people individually, politicians, leaders. And I think, as I say, Barack Obama, I think, was spoke to that. But I think we're going to see this play out over the next eight to 10 years, is who brings people together as a community best? And that can be done through the internet, which is why Facebook and MySpace and people basically now have building their selves connection through the internet. It's how do they gather. It's why Starbucks, nobody, Starbucks didn't become successful because they, everybody wanted $4 coffee. Starbucks became successful because it gave people another place to go outside of their home and their work to sit down and to gather and to do all that. That's, I think, if you're successful in politics, you're going to figure out a way to meet those needs at a time when people do not believe in the institutions that they've counted on for 50 years. Mr. Scranton. All of us appreciate what you said about confirmation bias. We know it. It's true. So do you also have some advice for the bearer of bad news who wants to speak to the leader or the executive about, you know, I'm seeing a, another reality out there that you need to be aware of. How can you make the, the, the messenger you know, more effective? Well, you know, I'm a believer in what Gandhi said, which is truth is God. Um, and I believe that if you tell somebody that it's, you're never wrong, tell, you're never going to be wrong, even if it creates a problem, telling somebody the truth, ultimately. It may make it uncomfortable for you. You may get fired. You may all that. But in the end, the way the world works and the way, the, you know, how karma works in the world, people will ultimately be fine if truth is their thing. It's very hard. It's very hard, especially at high levels of power, to tell there's people in this room that have had to speak to presidents. Um, I remember, just giving an example, I, I saw it said, say, tell the truth, to be able to do that, gut it up. I actually came from a family, because I have, I'm one of 11 kids, and so we learned early on that you know how to like fighting and and uh, discussions wasn't new to me um, in the course of that and how to like convey or tell somebody and you knew whether telling the truth was going to work out badly for you or not telling the truth which one was worse for you when you grow up in that situation um, because there was somebody constantly monitoring whether or not you were telling somebody the truth in my family obviously with eleven kids um, I to sort of give an example, and we all don't do it well. Sometimes you think, oh, my career, should I do this? Maybe there's a better opportunity. If I don't say it now, maybe I could say it later. All of those things that we do as human beings that we try to come through, and it's the better thing to tell somebody the truth. If somebody comes up and says, do I look thin in this, and they don't look thin in that, should I say, well, no, you look like a walrus. I mean, there's all of those sorts of things. All those things you have to, like, have to figure out and all of that. It is hard. I, I, I'll give you an example. I was in, during the re-elect, and it was in May of 2004, and the president asked, George Bush asked us to come over, it was about 12 of us, including Laura, the first, it, sure, it was Laura, uh, Laura, they were meeting with us to give an update on the campaign and that. And so it was Karen Hughes and Carl and me and Dan Bartlett and um, Josh Bolton, Ken Melman. It was about the 12 senior folks at the White House and at the campaign all came together. And we were sitting in the dip, dip room, diplomatic room, 
and the president first lady up there, and he starts off with this, you know, the chairs, and we're all sitting right in front of him. And I'm sitting right in front of him, like this, right there in my chair, right in front of him. And he starts going on this thing about, like, you know, this, we've got to get, you guys are doing a great job, we've got to keep up. And oh, by the way, he says this, oh, by the way, my numbers, keep in mind this is in May of 2004, my numbers are exactly where Ronald Reagan's were at the same time in 1984. And if we go, if we do our jobs, if everybody does it right, we're going to win in a landslide. And while he's saying this, which I have a hard time doing, my face was like, what on, my face was like, look, what on earth are you talking about? And so he stopped. He said, Maddie, it was what he, what he called me, Maddie. He said, Maddie, uh, why do you make that face? I was like, oh, Mr. President, what face? I was just, um, I was just listening. He goes, no, no, you had a face. Um, I said, well, you know, you know I, I, I hate to say this, but that's totally wrong. He's like, what? I said, that's totally wrong. I said, if we win this race, if we win, as I emphasize if, we're going to win it by two or three or four points. That's it's if we win this race. And I said, the idea that your numbers are like Ronald Reagan's, your numbers are like 14 points lower than Ronald Reagan's were. And Carl was sitting behind me right over there. He goes, Carl, Carl, you told me, you told me, you know, three days ago that my numbers were da, da, da. And, I, and Carl's like, well, if you factor in the historical anomaly of the thing, and I turned around to Carl and said, I'm sorry, I didn't know we were supposed to bullshit the president. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> so it is hard to do it, but. <laughs> All right, got a question. Can you give the, pre if you could give the president advice now, what would you tell him about getting back to the central issue in health care, which is, access for the poor and people who are uninsured. We've lost that message, in my opinion, well, through it's, all the garbage going on. Well, I think we've lost all the messages related to why people want health care reform. So we lost the message of access, and we lost the message of cost. So nobody out there in the American public, not, I shouldn't say nobody, a huge chunk of the American public doesn't believe that this is going to change access, is this going to lower their costs. So then they're like, well, why are we going to do health care reform? It's not going to change access, we're not going to change cost. If I were giving him advice, um, I would quit going out to town hall meetings and quit giving speeches out in the country and quit doing that and basically say, I'm going to stay in Washington and I'm not going to leave Washington. I'm going to meet with anybody, anytime. I'll go up to the Hill, I'll sit in a committee room, I'll do whatever until we get this done. And I'm not going to leave here and I'm going to make you kill the bill Instead of it making it look like I have done this thing, I'm going to make you do it, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, and work out a deal and get it done and say, you're not leaving, we're not going anywhere until this deal is done, and meet day after day after day after day. And don't worry about going to Boulder, Colorado, and speaking to a town hall meeting. The problem is, is he's got to convey to the American public that I want to get this done, I'm going to get this done, and if it means taking on some Democrats, I'm going to take on some Democrats. And if it means taking on the Republicans, I'm going to take it on. But the problem is Washington and force the issue. That's what I would do if I were him. Pretty good advice. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. I really enjoyed you, and I appreciate your objectivity. That's a very healthy spot to be. Uh, what, I want is, what I've observed is that Americans, you know, on our own soil and amongst, amongst our own people, it's beginning to be somewhat of a tinderbox. Uh, we have uh, people who can carry guns close to where the president is. Have you ever um, worked or been around a campaign where it's been that such danger as it is now? And where do you think it would go from that? Well, uh, I mean, I think that's a, a valid point, and I think that we, we are, you know, at times where there's great anxiety and great concern that are related to a lot of different issues, and then having a president that looks different than every other person they've seen in a book as they read a history book, obviously, that, that creates not only is the anxiety exists, but that creates all that. I have never, since I was like, you know, eight years old when the moon landing happened. I missed the whole 60s part. I missed the whole 60s part of that, where, which obviously, um, I think, in relation to that tinderbox that existed in the 60s, when 
you know, two Kennedys were assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was in Detroit and we had to move out of Detroit. We lived in Detroit and we had to move out of Detroit because tanks were rolling down Woodward Avenue in Detroit in the midst of riots. And so I think it is a problem. I think that's why it's how we talk to each other is and what that conversation is. I think Obama's tone is such a great tone and how he conveys himself and it's such a measured way, even if you disagree with him and all that, the tone of which and the way and manner of which, which he talks to people, I think many of us could pattern and do in our own conversations and all that. And so I think it is a tinderbox to a degree, but I don't think it's near the tinderbox that existed um, 40 years ago. And obviously we just recently saw in the, in the unfortunate death of Teddy Kennedy, um, what, what pictures of all that and what that was like. So. I think change the way we relate to each other, I think, and how we talk to each other, and not call each other names because we happen to like disagree with each other on, on some political issue, which is what I think, as I say, is I wish people that listen to Rush Limbaugh would like look, watch or listen to some other thing, and I wish people you know, that watched MSNBC, though I have, to I have to tell you, I, can't, I cannot watch MSNBC or Fox. I, I, I can't watch either one. And I, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sitting here going back to the days I wish Walter Cronkite was on CBS again. <laughs> I mean, probably we could have sort of thing. But I just changed the way we talk. But I, you know, I'm worried about the same, but I don't think it's near as a concern as, as it was 40 years ago. Stark, got a question back there. suggest a workable immigration policy for the United States? <laughs> wait, wait, I feel like Johnny Carson. The great car, <laughs> and the answer is, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I think the only workable solution is, is, I think the only workable, whatever the policy details on it, I think the only workable solution is the idea that conveys who America is. And America both is a strong hand and a big heart. And I think that what happens in this discussion is, is that people either are viewed or, oh, they're the ones that are viewed as have the big hearts, but they're not going to enforce the laws. The people enforce the laws say, like, you're just all, all you care about is that and you're not. And I think that that, I think, is another polarized debate that I, I believe there is a solution that provides enforcement to our laws, but also provides a compassionate solution to the existing situation that is, that I believe that, that it, that exists. But what happens in both political parties is they both launch, you know, latch onto both of those things. And I don't think the, I think the average American out there believes, oh you know, yeah, we, sh we should be able to enforce it. The average American, having seen all the polling, believes this. Yeah, we should be able to enforce our borders, and we shouldn't have to kick a bunch of people out of the country. That's what an average American believes. We should be able to enforce our borders, and we should be able to be compassionate to people in this country. That's what average people think in this country. And if 300 average people think it could get done, then I maybe 300 slightly below average people in Washington could get it done. So I don't know what the policy specifics, but I think it can get done with those two goals in mind, because Americans believe it. Right here, got a question right here. Chad's getting to you. Good afternoon, my name is Ratna Sari Dewi. I'm from Indonesia. I'm uh, from Clinton School, a student here. Uh, thank you for being here. And I was afraid that my question is a little bit sensitive, but I will ask you anyway, because this is the good opportunity for me to really ask. So my question is, uh, it happened and, when I was about 22 <laughs> years old. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Starting. <laughs> so about 2004, when uh, George Bush was about being a president, one Indonesian paper wrote that the that Bush campaign at the time was to make people, American people, concerned about the terrorism attack. And I believe in, to some extent, it also like affected the relationship between the United States and also some uh, Muslim communities in the world. So I would like to ask, how did you anticipate at the time that this issue also will fly away out, outside the United States and also will affect the Muslim communities? Thank okay. you. That's a, a very good question because it's funny because political campaigns not only are communicating 
they're not just sort of in totally in a vacuum. They're communicating many things in the course of it, not only domestically, but internationally. All of us are involved in this, especially running a re-election campaign, understand that. There's an administration that has policies and goals, State Department, all of that, that knows all that. And the president was actually sensitive to, to, to that. I think one of the myths that grew out is that of, the, of the thing is that that, that the campaign somehow like created anxiety or created a problem or, or made national security a bigger deal than it was. It's just not true. It's just not true. The best campaigns say, this is where the American public is. This is what they're anxious about. This is what they want to talk about. This is what they're concerned about. And then you, you can't just ignore that. You talk about that. And so I think... So then you talk about that. Did we always, did it, was it always done in the most sensitive way possible that affected, that might affect somebody in a foreign country? No. Um, just like many foreign countries have campaigns that do things that we understand in the course of the campaigns, things are said and they happen in the course of that. Did, were we cognizant of that? Yeah. I think anybody um, that is, that holds an Oval Office that's running for re-election understands there's many audiences for a message, many audience for the message that it's affected. But we were in a re-elect, I mean, keep in mind that we were in a re-elect in 2004 for a president in a time, in a way that never had, nobody had ever seen before, which was in the aftermath of 9-11, which never had happened here before, and all of the course of events that went on, we were actively engaged in two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. And so it was a different time, and the country was in a place where that was a huge concern of what we were going to do, what we weren't going to do. Was Bush doing the right policies? Was he not doing the right policies? So there is a, was a sensitivity to it, but, you know, of that and the audiences out there and all of that. And the president, as I say, had a very much a huge sensitivity to that. And what he said and what somebody else in another country might hear when he said that, you always don't do it perfectly, so it was imperfectly done in the course of a re-election campaign. We've got time for one more question. We have a student right there. My name is Adam Moreland. I'm a Clinton student. Um, we are actually discussing in class the idea of uh, positive open conflict. And my question to you is, whose role is it to open up that political, that positive conflict so that we can, instead of having partisan politics arguing one side or the other, whose role is it to get that moving in a positive direction so we can jointly come to an agreement and move forward? Okay. That's a great question, and I'm going to answer that question in a couple of different ways. The first thing is, I remember when I broke with the president, and I obviously haven't been a Democrat and all that, when I had the break with the president, the major reason why I said was, is we said we were going to bring the country together, we said we were going to get past the polarization, we said we were going to reach the aisle, and in, across the aisle, we started and never did it. We started it and never finished it or never really completed it. And the pushback for me, both internally before I did that, uh, and then externally after I did that, was, well, the media is at fault because they're just, they're creating conflict and they're at fault. Or it's the Democrats in Congress, they've never really fully been willing to come across the aisle and compromise. They've always been wanting to get in a fight. And my answer to that was, I was only responsible for one person. And if he didn't do it, I don't, I'm not responsible for the, what the Democrats do in Congress. And just like today, when the debate that I hear on many out of people's minds is, well, Barack Obama, you know, he'd be bipartisan, but the Republicans, they just won't come across the aisle with us. Well, he's only responsible for one person. And everybody is only responsible from the place they come in. So if it's going to happen, it's never going to happen if we say we're going to wait on whoever else to do it. It's going to happen to me. The President of the United States has to basically say, it's worth my time. This is important. I think good public policy will come out if the result of it. I think the American public demands this and wants this, and I'm going to do it even if it's going to make people in my own party angry, that's what I think is important to do and to do that. And I think Nancy Pelosi, I think uh, Mitch McConnell, I think they all could do it. But as I say, we're all responsible. And I think the idea that, that somehow that we have to blame the other side, the reason why we're not being, I love, I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you something funny that's about bipartisanship. Whenever I hear politicians a lot of times do it, I'm gonna paraphrase Margaret Thatcher on this. Bipartisanship is a lot like being a lady. If you have to tell, your, tell people you're one, you're probably not. 
So it's done, it, it, you prove it, don't tell it. And so the start is with him. Thank you all very much. Matthew Dowd, ladies and gentlemen.